Okay, I think we're going to get going. Uh, good morning. I'm Bob Rockmaker, President of the Flight School Association of North America. Uh, quick question, show of hands. How many of you, is this your first migration? How many of you have been here two or three times at least? Okay, so about, about a 50 50 split. Um, some of you I recognize um, as members, and many of you I don't. And uh, just nice to see you. I'm glad you came in here to talk a little bit about uh, culture and hear what we have to say. Um, the Flight School Association was formed in 2009. We are an organization that represents all different types of flight schools across the country and a couple foreign countries. Um, about 500 members. Next week in Las Vegas is our annual conference. We have an oversubscribed group right now. Uh, we're trying to relay out a floor plan, 35 exhibitors plus, and um, so we have some challenges. I'm here for the day. I'll be around to about 2.30. I have meetings in Orlando at 4 o'clock. Happy to talk to you at any point. Um, so, why did I pick culture to begin this uh, discussion today? So, the history of the song will lay that groundwork for you. And um, then I think it'll just be a good segue as we can go through this. Before I founded the song, Pennsylvania ran a flight school conference. Three states were invited. The purpose was to help enhance the business of flight training. How many flight schools are in here if you're a flight school owner or operator? Okay. And how many flight instructors are in the Okay. Good. Thank you. So, back in the early days, before Sasonic got started, we saw a need in my smaller state association to bring people together to collaborate, cooperate, digest information, and at the same time, help improve the culture of flight training, the business culture of flight training. And as a result, we had started that in 1997. In 2001, April, we moved that conference, even though it was a state-based organization, to Orlando. At the recommendation of several people, including Hal Shepard from Sports, Peggy Chabrin from Women in Aviation, but we formed a little advisory group. And um, that was the beginning of a more national type of movement for the flight schools of America. Subsequently, we had a little bit of a problem in September of 2001 with the attacks. And as you all probably know, everything stopped. Airlines weren't, you know, the 121s weren't flying. Uh, flight schools were closed for weeks, months. We had 2,400 flight schools back in 2001. And today there's about 1,600 organized flight schools. So we lost about a third of our schools. Uh, many did not reopen. So, subsequently, I had said to myself, and a few other people. Oh. If the opportunity presented itself to one day have an organization and no one else had stood it up, I would take a shot. And nobody did anything, and the school industry needed it. You know, we are your association. Many schools just don't know that we are your association, but we're here for you. We help schools, whether they're members or not. Uh, there is a, a limit to that, but we do help people, no matter whether they're members or not. 
And uh, subsequently, you know, today, from 2009, which is when we started the association, um, we are, we're really continuing to grow, helping to move things, and this presentation, I think you'll see how culture is going to weave right into this thing, and uh, hopefully you'll leave here with a little bit of a new insight into culture and how it applies at your particular organization, whether you are an independent instructor, flight school owner, operator, manager, etc. Um, I'd like to point out uh, two people in the room, Chris Erlinson, Chris, a vice chairman of our board, happened to, wanted to come in and uh, listen to this session. Um, he's going to be uh, reporting back to our board, I guess. <laughs> Hope I do okay. <laughs> and uh, Paul Berger, uh, chairman and founder of the uh, Wings Industry Network, also with us in this room. Uh, Paul, good to have you here. Thank you, Paul. You're a good leader. So, we're here at Migration 22. Um, migration started in 2009, I believe, the same year that Fasana was formed, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> All right. Anybody from AD can help me with this, it's not moving the slides. Okay. Yeah. And I'm following the directions specifically for your uh, team. Yes. You'll probably have to just manually click through your slides on the laptop. The laptop. So, if I want to go back, use the, uh, the right side. Thank you. So, you know what? What is, what is culture? You know, what what is culture? How do you change culture? Um, culture is a a major component of the foundational structure of every organization, every business that exists, whether it's a for profit or a non profit. Um, for simplicity. I'm going to share with you culture is the quality of a person, a community, or a society. That is the purest level. Our speaker, uh, uh, just before the general session, had the word culture up on the uh, screen several times, if you notice there. Culture is not easy to change. It's a short word. It's a short word. But culture is not easy to change. And having a good culture and a consistent culture in everything we do, whether it's our personal lives or our business lives, makes all the difference in the world we're here. So uh, hopefully just try to remember that simple, what I'll call a simple definition, the quality of a person, a community, or society in general. What I thought I'd do is take the letters and literally do a departure off the runway of these letters to help us understand why culture is so important, especially in the flight training industry. So, in the flight training industry, at the ab initio level, we have the highest churn rate of any part of this industry. <coughs> C-H-U-R-N, churn. Instructors, you know, those that become instructors, because that's basically the entry point to your next part of your general aviation life or your commercial life, are in the game for about 18 to 24, maybe 30 months. And they're out the door. Not all, not 100%. <clears throat> but they're out the door. And I remiss, um, I also would like to introduce Karen Kalashek, chair of uh, NAF. My, my apologies. My apologies. Um, so, having developed a culture, how many of you? 
whether you're an instructor or you're a business owner, how many of you have established a culture at your at your model, at your business model? Okay, so maybe half, maybe half the hands have blown up, which is fine. Uh, good for you. <laughs> Establish and identify your culture because that begins to lay the foundational platform for your business home. Even if you're an individual instructor, do the best you can and have that foundational plan in place. Having a continuous, and the word C for continuous in culture, deployment of your culture is the key. You, you cannot start a positive culture and then drop away and go do other things. If you're the owner and you're too busy, then have somebody else on your team be the lead for culture. And put it in writing. You should put something in writing. What, what is your culture? Define it. Because it defines who you are. And it never stops. Um, if you don't have a good culture today, if you don't have a culture at all, go get one, build one, create one. If you have one, revisit and look at it, and take a look and see what is your culture. And is it is it working out for you? Are you happy? Are your customers happy? Are your employees happy with your culture? And I'm gonna get into some examples, and some of them are not good. You for unlimited. The sky, and this is no pun intended here, but the sky is not the limit if you develop a good positive culture. It's amazing what some of the schools that are going to be with us next week in Las Vegas started with two aircraft, and there's nothing wrong with having one or two aircraft, by the way. There's, you can have a great school with two airplanes or three airplanes. <laughs> but there are schools that have started with one or two airplanes. They developed their culture. They came to conferences. They talked to people with a lot of experience. They were mentored by people. They were connected to other people. You know, it's all about connectivity. And today they are up to two locations, two geographic training locations, and I believe 15 aircraft. And that's a decent little operation, you know? So, again, culture with the you can lead to many, many good things. Or some bad things as well. L for leadership, obviously. Obviously, leadership is key. It starts with you, whether you're the owner, the manager, chief flight instructor, if, if, if you don't have some positive leadership skills, if you do not see the glass as half filled, if you are an enabler, everybody know what enabling is all about? If you allow somebody to do something and have a negative uh, uh, type deployment and you turn the other way, and I'm going to give you an example. Right now, I was contacted two weeks ago by the president of one of the largest banks in the aviation industry, supplying money to you all, well, to your students, potential to your students. And he, he started to tell me about a student who called the bank and said, the school is not safe. I have to leave here and they won't give me the rest of my money back. The bank had lent $100,000. This is not a foreign student, this is an American student. A hundred K went out. The school is giving this uh, student a real runaround. Several students have now brought lawsuits. I will not name the school. 
The bank president asked me to talk to one of his senior vice presidents who had more information. I've now subsequently had a conversation with the student who's 31 years of age and has flown off 25,000 of the $100,000. And this is going to impact all of you and Fasan. It's a bad practice. If I can shut down that school today, I don't have that power. I'm just a janitor. I will shut them down. <laughs> That's how bad this is. And the number of students that have deposit monies here, I'm going to estimate right now it's between two to three million dollars. And this is the type of stuff that's going to get to the Wall Street Journal, the USA Today. And all of you, it's going to impact everybody. And Fasada has worked so hard culturally to call out some of these schools. Um, the really bad news is there's a very mature Part 141 chief flight instructor at this school as well. The FAA, as you all know, doesn't care about your cash in and your cash out. Right? They don't really care if you make money, don't make money. They do care about safety. And let me tell you, when the student told me that the chief flight instructor told him, and this is a I'm not even going to tell you what gender, because I don't want to give anything away. I can't afford to. 50-year-old chief flight instructor who told this 31-year-old student pilot with 81 hours and doesn't have a private yet, 25,000 in, that it's okay to take your solo cross country without the flaps operating on the aircraft. <laughs> Okay? I'm an airman. You know, most of you are probably airmen or airwomen, right? We all know you don't dispatch an airplane like that. I've never operated a flight school, but I've flown a lot of airplanes, including jets, and you just you just don't send that you don't send an airplane out. And the student didn't go. That's why the student wants their money back, and they can't get it. As a result, I don't know what's going to happen here, but we've also been in touch with the FAA on this. But this is culture. But this this school in America is going to give us a black eye, and exactly at the wrong time, because we're getting ready to open up our accreditation program, and we're working with the Secretary of Education. And when Congress and the Secretary of Education and others see that flight schools, private schools, keep in mind, Congress doesn't want private flight schools to have Title IV money. They basically don't. They don't like private schools getting money. They want the money to all go to colleges, which are nonprofits. The timing is terrible. So hopefully this is going to get under control quickly before it gets too far out of control. The last time there was a major incident like this was in Long Beach, California. A CBS television producer called me, said, I don't want to interview you, but I need your help and guidance. It was a group of foreign students in Long Beach. These were foreign students. Parents had sent in the money, you know, the wire transfer of the money, about three to four million on, on the table. And the school closed, the lights were off, phones stopped. Door was locked, and this gentleman happened to know one of the students. And he was advocating and trying to find out how did this happen in America? How how could somebody take that amount of money and nobody can find anybody? The airplanes are parked out there all locked up. And he said, This is not an interview, I'm not recording you. And and we did as much as we could do. And the state of California had already passed legislation, state legislation on this topic, regarding how much deposit money an educational organization can put accept at any one time. But obviously, again, the culture, the culture of that school owner was, we don't care about that. And they just went right ahead, took that money, and most of those students 
you know, lost that money. Some of the students had parents who could bring some more money back into the country. Uh, we found a really good, one of our Fasana members out on the West Coast, uh, they took a few students in and finished their Zero to Hero and it worked out. But there were others that absolutely just lost their money and it's so sad. So again, culture, you know, uh, when, when, this ha when this type of thing happens, it impacts all of us. It may not hit your bottom line today, but it impacts us. And um, can you imagine a cheap flight instructor saying it's okay, again, to send down an airplane? Again, we have the money side, and then we have the safety and operational side. Two different topics, but really poor culture. Culture that just, I don't know what else to say. Um, we'll go to, uh, to trending just for a little bit here. So what, 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 what is trending? What, what is the T? Why, why trending? So, you know, what, what's happening in the industry? Well, this morning, I got in this morning from Philadelphia. I think uh, it was like one o'clock when I actually put my head down on a, on a pillow. So this morning I got up and I had a discussion with a captain from Delta for about 10 minutes uh, before I came down here. And I said, so what's, what's trending in your side? You know, and he's a senior captain. I know he was a senior captain. So I knew I might get some interesting insight. And he says, uh, well, I'll tell you. I don't think we've ever seen what we're seeing. I don't have the answer because I don't run the airline. I'm not the president or CEO. But I do see, I do see more regional airlines parking more airplanes, shortage of pilots. It's, it's real, you know, to a point it's real. I said, what about the scope clauses? Does everybody know what scope clauses are here? Everybody knows scope clauses. Um, you know, the main airlines basically control the region. And they basically tell them how many seats you can fly between these two city pairs, and they tell you what city pairs you can fly. Some of the regionals are owned by the majors. More and more are being purchased that way. Some have gone out of business, as you know, like ExpressJet and Atlanta, they're gone. Boom. Uh, and a few others. So, you know, what, what's, what's trending in our culture? Well, <laughs> number one, we're going to need pilots for a long time. We're not going to have autonomous aircraft, at least in my lifetime. People are not going to get on a 175-seat airplane and go fly around without pilots up front. It's just not going to happen. I'm not saying it can't happen technologically, but right now the culture is just, we're just not ready. We're humanly not ready for it, okay? Um, we need to make flight instructors. Where do we get flight instructors from? You know, we know where they come from, right? And you start down here and you work your way up. That's the way it's always been. And uh, he, he said, I agree with you. We're not going to see the fifteen hundred dollars rate change for a while. The sign would love to change it. We, I'd love to. We have a board meeting coming up next Saturday, and that's an agenda item to talk about. But I also know it's a very tough agenda item because Senator Schumer will just rip into anybody at any point in time. And so, you know, the chances of the fifteen hundred hour rule being loosened up, I'm not so sure that's going to happen right now. I also don't think it may be a good idea because we'll lose instructors even sooner. The owners of schools <laughs> will have an increased churn rate. If, it, if you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. And, um, and that's, that's difficult too. You know, as Karen knows, okay, and anyone else who's an instructor knows, you know, when you become a CFI, you're still a neophyte. You're a neophyte. For the most part, unless your parents have been flying for years, your dad's a corporate pilot flying a 650 golf stream or something, you know, you're, 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 you're still very new. And so, if you can take a CFI and get them to 700 hours, imagine how many students they're going to get through before they're, they're off your payroll, so to speak. Which means 
it's going to be even tougher for the flight school owner operator to, to continuously deliver quality training at that school and institution. So, again, why is culture really a, a, a big dog in the hunt? It's because of each of these words here that I've, I've put up for you, you know, and the trending, I'm not making this up, you read the Wall Street, you guys and, and ladies read what's going on out there, so I'm just reiterating a little bit of what is trending. And uh, so having a good culture, a consistent, delivered culture will make a difference for you. Because there's other problems coming down the runway here. Uh, unify, obviously, you know, sit down with your team, draft your cultural statement. It doesn't have to be 20 pages long. But come up with your cultural statement. What, what's important to you in your business model? You know? And go to the positive, obviously. Um, return, for those of you who own a school, ROI. And that's not like ROI, ROI. Return on investment. You want to see some money come back into your coffers. You want some profit. Profit's not a bad word. You know, it's part of the way we do business. It's capitalism. It's 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 okay to make some money. If you don't have a good culture, I can't assure you with 100 percent that I can almost say you're going to have a very difficult time of keeping your model consistently delivering high quality services to your customers. So it's going to impact your bottom line. And equity. So we have the reason you're in business is to make money, right? And hopefully part of that is you're building equity. Just like you maybe own a house and you build equity in that property. How does a flight school build any equity? Because most airport leases, as you all know, you cannot own your buildings. You lease. I'm a former airport director. Airports are like big shopping malls, folks. They lease. They love to lease. Owning property is almost impossible. Not totally, but almost impossible on public airports. So, so how do you build your equity? You take the cash out, if you can get some cash, okay, you put that park it someplace and invest it someplace else, that's fine. But you also have aircraft. So if you're a flight school owner, you have aircraft. Most aircraft are owned, right? Most schools own their airplanes. Although leasing seems to be getting a little more attractive. We're, we're seeing a few more companies enter the leasing market, as a matter of fact, um, compared to just a year or two ago, three years ago. But you have aircraft. So if you have 10 aircraft and they're each worth 40 grand, that's 400,000, you know, etc. You just do the math. So if you were to sell your school, you're gonna get the goodwill and you're gonna get, um, for the most part, the aircraft out of your school. That's the way it works. And John, my, right? You just did it. Yeah. He's a school owner right here. Um, so if you don't have a good culture, the E in equity gets really tough. So then you have to ask yourself, what am I doing? Why am I, why am I doing this? What's the purpose? Because most people that own a flight school, they love aviation, but they also want to make some money. Again, there's nothing wrong with making a couple bucks. So that's a little you know, quick step-by-step uh, -step of the word culture and where it you know, where it uh, applies into the school environment, the flight training environment. Obviously, if you're an independent instructor, a little different, but still, you know, you're, you're making your dollars as an independent flight instructor. And hopefully, you have money left over and you're putting that to use someplace, you know, whether you invested Fidelity Vanguard or you probably don't want to put it in the bank and you're going to get a quarter of a point or maybe a half a point half of one percent. Uh, so culture is a really, really uh, big 
big item. And I think, you know, my fraternity brother, Mark Zuckerberg, is one of the few people in the country that changed culture very, very quickly. Very few people change culture quickly. It's not easy to change it. Not easy. Um, I'm not saying all the culture that Mark has changed is for the better or for the worse. I'm simply saying it's very difficult when you leave here and go back to your businesses, your operations, whatever, to begin that process. But if you, if you, you got to begin. You just got to dig in and begin and come up with some one page document on what is your culture at your establishment, whether it's a flight school, it's an ice cream store, I don't care what it is, it doesn't matter. It will absolutely be the beginning of a reinforcement of your foundational core values that will lead to never ending improvement at your business operation. There's, there's, there's two parts to culture that I want to share with you. For the most part, we've been talking, for the most part, about the business culture, the business culture. So we've already, we've already covered this first slide pretty well in depth. Okay. Again, if you have a non-existent or a poor business culture. Chances are your business model is challenged, you're facing issues, and even when you have a, a great culture, you're still going to have issues and challenges. So it, it, you don't escape it either way, you don't escape it. And the other culture I want to touch on a little bit here, and these are the two core, the, the two core cultures in our industry. We talked about the business. We're going to talk about safety. Since I, I, and I very seldom say I'm the founder of Asana because I'm, I'm the head janitor. Chris has heard that. I, I don't consider myself anything special at all. The number of times we've seen flight schools be forced into an asset sale because they've had one accident, maybe one fatal or two serious accidents. Uh, and, and Chris, am I am, am I saying this correct or not? Yeah. Right. Anybody who runs a business flight school and doesn't think they're that close, and, and John, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. And, and you have, you know, Chris and you don't have this to worry about, okay? But Jimmy Crickets, um, <clears throat> we've seen it. We we've, we've seen it happen numerous times. You can't get insurance anymore, or they take those rates and they just skyrocket them up 25-30% annualized. Who pays for that? As far as I know, I'm not paying for it, and John and Chris aren't paying for it. Your customer's going to pay for that. Now that takes your rate per hour and just out the kazoo. So, you know, having, having a safety culture within your organization is, is so critical today. And part of that starts with having zero accidents. And Pasada is now leading for the past, say, 18 months, a, a major campaign, and will continue to lead this, to have zero accidents. If you don't have accidents, you don't have fatals. Okay? The, the, the insurance companies have the right to make money. If there's anybody from the insurance world here, you have the right to make profit. And the way they do it, insurance, as you all know, is just like one big actuarial calculation. They operate with one cash register. And at the end of the year, the revenue in minus what they had to pay out based on claims, based upon legal court proceedings, you know? Uh, there was a very serious S-76 helicopter accident, if you all recall, in California. Just that accident alone, just that accident, absolutely impacted everybody 
in this room, in that room over there, all across the country. And then you take the two Mac 737s that went down those airframes, that didn't help. And you take other accidents that are, you know, you know, 135 related. Uh, you know, luckily, there's not too many flight school accidents. We're, we're, we're blessed to be able to say that. It does happen. You know, UND had one, uh, what, five months ago or so, four months ago, you know, and uh, that was a suicide. Um, one of our Fasana members had a suicide about uh, two years ago and had no idea the airplane was all you know, in good shape. The person flew it into the Atlantic Ocean off Cape May, New Jersey. And unfortunately, that same school had a second fatal within, I believe, 18 months. That was another asset so it's, it's almost impossible to come back from these things. And most schools, as you all know, anybody who's a school here, you know that about the most insurance you're going to get is about $2 million in liability. Give or take. You know, there are schools out there that get more. They've got 50 aircraft, 100 aircraft. They've got umbrella policies. They got tertiary umbrella policies, you know. But for the most part, um, you know, one to two million is about where you're at. So, you know, if you happen to kill somebody whose father has a business and he or she is going to inherit that business, and that this is true, I'm going to tell you all the details, but uh, right down in this area, actually, HVAC company, they had 35 trucks. That deployed out to go fix your heating and air conditioning in the greater Orlando Lake area. And there was a fatal, and the son, who was going to be inheriting the business, he died along with the instructor, who was a turbine rated, type rated person that flew a, a NASCAR jet on a full time basis. So experienced people, but they were in a, a twin, Pat Piper Apache, which, you know, is not, it's okay. I, I got my multi in a, an Apache, but. Uh, it's not a real fast airplane, and, you know, you pull an engine and basically you should be prepared to land pretty quickly on the patch. Great airplane, great airplane, but you got to know the limitations. And, uh, you know, that, that was a terrible accident, two fatalities, and uh, that school had you know, 20 aircraft, and they're gone. They're gone. And the owner was a good person. So, you know, what's your safety culture? Do you have an SMS system? Do you, do you have anything in writing? Um, do you really take safety seriously? Because if you don't, I'm sorry to say, but you're, you're just very close to having a sale. And believe me, it happens more than anybody thinks. You don't hear about it, you don't hear about it, but it does happen a lot. So, having a having a basic core safety management system of some type at your school is a really good idea. Can you imagine a Part 141 school with, I believe, 17 aircraft, two locations, 17 aircraft, and they say it's okay to go fly. A, stu a student solo cross country. No fly. And I fully agree. I think everybody in this room that flies knows you, you got to prepare to land a machine with no flaps. And you can do it. But you certainly don't start out a mission with no flaps. Again, part 141 school. So maybe somebody in this room is asking, where was the FAA? Now, the FAA has had a hotline complaint on this as well. And uh, Fasan has also reached out. When we reach out at the sauna, we're not reaching out to physios, by the way. Just as a side note, we don't have time for physio managers. There's 82 FAAs, folks. If there's anybody in the FAA here, um, I'm not being disrespectful to you. I'm not. But there's many FBO, uh, many uh, physios out there, and they each act as their own little mini FAA. And uh, hopefully, with work that we're doing and some others, you know, AOPA, we need to see that continuously evolved. There's one FAA, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to talk about that topic today. 
But um, you know, safety culture is, is is just as critical as the business culture. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. So we've we've talked on, I mean, pretty much the core two fundamental <laughs> parts of this um, chat today. We have about five minutes left. I'm happy to answer any questions. If any of you didn't know about Fasana, you'd like to come to our conference next week, we'll give you the uh, early bird rate. If you join the association, that's all we ask you to do. And um, you know, that's a, an offer you know, that we put on the table for you if you'd like to come out. I know some of you are coming. I mean, I've, several people have walked up to me uh, since I walked in this morning here and you know, said, hey, I'll see you next week. You know, and, oh, good to see you here and so forth. But if any of you, would like to come, we're certainly happy to do it and we'll extend that early bird rate to you. Uh, you just contact the office. You can find us, just go to fsana.com. So I appreciate your time this morning. I hope I made sense. I hope I delivered something that maybe you'll take away here, go back to your operation. I hope I didn't bore you. Um, if I did, I apologize. But folks, if you don't take this seriously, it doesn't matter how clean your airplanes are. It doesn't matter how good your front desk people are. You, you need to have this cultural concept built in to your operation at this point. The companies that don't do this tend to not be around long term. Take a look at how many companies aren't around by the way. It's amazing how many are not around. And I'm talking big companies, not just companies that do five or ten million dollars. It's unbelievable how many are not around. So um, I'll take a couple questions. If there's any questions, we can talk about anything you want to talk about. And if not, you know, we're, we're free. Probably, I guess, lunch is about to be served. So anybody have anything they want to get down?